Welcome, Soul Visionaries. I'm your host, Sherrod Cohen, and you are now entering into the Soul Vision Powercast, a place where we keep it unfiltered and raw. We'll discuss anything from porn to politics. We'll even talk about things you might have heard or even saw. Today, we're going to talk about feminism, toxic feminism. Uh, I have a video I'm leading off with. Uh, her name is Susan Vinker. It's called, Here's What Makes Feminism So Insidious. And then I also have an article called, um, entitled, uh, Toxic Femininity Exists, What Is It, and What You Need to Know. Please sit back, enjoy, and if you enjoy, uh, like, subscribe, share, become a soul visionary, and let's kick it. Today I'm going to lead off with the, the video from Susan Vinker, Here's, what's make, Here's What Makes Feminism So Insidious. I'm going to let it play all the way through. It's a 10 minute and 38 minute, uh, 38 second video. I'm going to play it in its entirety so you can just get the, uh, the full impact of the video. And, um, I'm glad it's, I'm glad a, a woman is doing it. So it doesn't make it seem like it's just men complaining about it, men complaining about it. So without further ado, Hey, I'm going to kick it, uh, kick it into high gear and let's, let's, Let's check out Susan Vinker. Here's what makes feminism so insidious. The women who have the most power in this country are not everyday women like you and I who are living quiet and hopefully happy lives. They're a very left-leaning, disgruntled bunch who reside first and foremost in our universities. That's where the propaganda really begins. But also in the White House, in the news media, and in the most impressionable space of all, Hollywood. These women, along with their weak-minded male colleagues, routinely and incessantly sell the idea that men are toxic and that women are victims of a society that is set up to make them fail. How can women ever be content in an environment that insists they're victims? How is that possible? And how can men and women find their way to each other under such destructive cultural conditioning? Just the other day, Netflix CEO Ted Sarandos said about his profession, quote, storytelling has real impact in the real world. Mm-hmm, you think? That impact can be hugely positive and it can be quite negative. And indeed, the messaging that comes out of Hollywood is almost all negative when it comes to the relationship between women and men. Very little, if any pop culture, has narratives about love that are uplifting empowering, or just plain real. And what we see and hear around us is hugely impactful on our thoughts and decision making. Most people need to be confirmed by the society in which they live. So if the constant drumbeat to which we're exposed is that men, especially fathers, are clueless at best and dangerous at worst, what do you think that's going to do to women's perception of men? And what do you think we're going to get from men in return, we're going to get exactly what we are getting. To begin, a widening education gap across the US. The number of men currently enrolled at two and four year colleges has fallen behind women at record levels. And this imbalance has massive implications for society. Not because there's anything wrong with not having a college degree. In fact, the state of universities today is such that I personally believe they're going to fall apart eventually, but that's a different conversation. <laughs> but because women are predisposed to marry men of equal or higher status. Let me say that again. Women are predisposed to marry men of equal or higher status. Women aren't doing anything wrong in wanting that. It is literally how they're wired. And for good reason which I'll come back to in a moment. What this means is that if women continue to outpace men on college campuses so dramatically, as they currently are, the number of equally college-educated men will be so small that women won't be able to find the kind of man they want to start a family with when they do later on become hell-bent on doing so, which almost all women do. And indeed we learned, sorry, and indeed we just learned that that's exactly what's happening, as college-educated women are now choosing to have babies outside of marriage. 
This is new for this demographic. And while there may be more than one reason for it, at the end of the day, it comes down to women having been encouraged to map out a life that leaves no space for marriage and motherhood. Today, women focus exclusively on education and career and believe they have all the time in the world to get married and start a family. But their bodies have a different plan. Just as women begin to hit their peak at work, their biological clock is winding down. It is at this point that women become laser focused on having a baby. Only their choices for a husband have dramatically dwindled. This same outcome would be true in any era, but it's especially true in an era in which there are far fewer marriageable men. The pool has shrunk in part because many women are lacking purpose and a plan for their lives. They just aren't motivated. And guess what doesn't motivate a man to action? Telling him he's superfluous, that he doesn't matter. Letting him know that women rule the world now and that he'll have to get in line with her requirements if he wants a seat at the table. It isn't until or unless a woman has a son that she is able to see all of this for what it is. America is clueless about the value of men and what they offer women, children, and society. We scoff at the fact that fatherhood is indispensable for the health and well-being of children. We reject that men's needs and desires and behaviors are any different, or should be any different, from women's. We insist that it, is, we insist that it doesn't matter if a woman out-earns her man, which not only strips men of their primary identity either. In 2017, Pew Research published a finding that was headlined, Americans see men as financial and as the financial providers, even as women's contributions grow. 71% of all Americans, men and women, said that a man's earnings are quote unquote, very important for him to be a good husband. A mere 25% said the same about women. And that is where the rubber meets the road, right there because that isn't economics. That's male and female nature. And it isn't going away. And it isn't going away for one simple reason. Because women have babies and men do not. And this has dramatic implications. Not the least of which is that women become vulnerable at this stage of life and in fact do need a man on whom they can depend. Because if a woman marries a man who's not motivated to achieve or to build something on behalf of his family, the biological imperative of mom and baby cannot be met. When this happens, mothers and babies want to be together but can't be. And this phenomenon is wreaking havoc on women who are thrust back into the workforce long before they're ready to be there. And that's when their lives become unmanageable. That's when the real problems begin. This phenomenon is not due to outdated government policies regarding paid leave and childcare, as you will hear ad nauseum in the media. And even if it were, those things are a temporary fix at best. They don't solve the underlying problem. The real problem is that modern women have been encouraged to build lives that do not work in the long term. And that quite frankly, don't even match what most of them want. Being career focused feels innocuous when a woman is in her 20s. But most women still want to get married and have a family someday. And when they do, their priorities will change dramatically. And if they have not planned well for this season of life, they will find themselves stuck. Had they been encouraged to reverse their priorities from the get go, to put marriage and family at the center and tailor all other life decisions academically, professionally, and even financially, around that instead, their lives would be functioning more smoothly. We're running around in this country acting as though men and women must live identical lives in order to be deemed equally valuable. It doesn't need to be this way. 
there's a completely different and much more powerful way to approach the relationship between women and men. To build a relationship that lasts, men and women must take into account their respective biological proclivities. This is true both in dating and in marriage, but it is in marriage where a couple becomes interdependent, which means they depend on each other. It's a team effort that's designed to be complementary, not a competition. And unfortunately, that's exactly what it has become, thanks to America's obsession with so-called gender equality, which seeks to strip men and women from their innate differences and make them interchangeable. That's key, that word is key. Not just the same, although it means basically the same thing, but interchangeable. That doesn't matter whether it's a man or woman doing something or that there are no differences between them. But in order to subscribe to this radical worldview, one would have to believe that the work involved in raising helpless newborns to become physically and mentally healthy adults is somehow less, valu less valuable than work that produces a paycheck. As you can see, she was talking about empowering women and not men, the dangers of it. I mean, women will become empowered and they won't have suitable mates for themselves because they'll naturally look down on men that aren't making as much as they are. When I look at the black culture and I see what's going on as far as, you know, we have black and women empowerment, black women this, black women that, but then when you look at what's going on in the black community for black men, there's nothing. You know, you have, you know, I spoke on this uh, several videos about how black men have gotten to the point, you know, where they pander to, to women. And they pander to women to the point where it's, it's they, they want, they call themselves uplifting women, but it's not really uplifting women when you appease them and basically lie to them to make them feel good about themselves. So, you know, I've, I've gone back and forth with this topic several times with different people and this and that and the other. And to be totally honest with you, you know, to, to uplift women and to degrade men, especially black women, black men, when you do that, you know, you create an imbalance in our communities. And what are you telling young black men about themselves when you are doing this, when you're, when you basically blame all the ills of the black community on men? You know, feminism, feminism is a toxic feminism as, as, we're, as it is. You know, most people don't believe, oh no, it doesn't exist. It's only toxic masculinity. No, toxic feminism, you know, it, it goes beyond just wanting men and women to be equal. You know, they actually want to become the very thing that they claim men are, and that's the oppressor. You know, um, I have another article that I want to um, read to you guys. It's called Toxic Femininity Exists. What is it and what you need to know? And it's by the Hormona Team. And I have the link to this article in the description below later on. Uh, it starts as, it says, we've all heard the phrase, the, the phrase toxic masculinity thrown around. Think aggressive, dominant behavior, objectifying, catcalling, mansplaining, hell, even manspreading. We really have gone into depth. But what about the reverse side, toxic femininity? Is it a thing? What is toxic femininity? Toxic femininity is essentially a way for women to sabotage others by using her traditionally feminine qualities. It is where a woman's response to a long-standing threat of failure, underappreciation, or a need to prove herself over her male peers reacts by resenting the women around her who are fighting the same battles. Toxic female behavior. This can take many forms such as gossip and social exclusion of the women around. Because toxic femininity isn't simple and straightforward, it is rather hard to explain and define it. 
Although there's still a way to go, more women than ever are bagging those high level degrees, jobs and positions of power. But instead of sharing a sisterly bond of pride and celebration as our foremothers may have hoped, we oft often look at our high achieving ladies with the paranoid and jealousy steeped side eye. I've noticed that when women are in power, they are more misogynistic towards other women than any man could ever be. You know, the, the backbiting, the backstabbing, and the things of that nature, that's so prevalent within this pseudo sisterhood that, I mean, you can, you can notice it, the tension when certain women walk in a room full of other women. Um, just as in the past, and indeed to some extent still today, women competed for male attention with the goal of marrying well. They now seem to do the same before the attention of a boss, a professor, or a client. The motivation may have moved forward, but the method has not. The, this intrinsic envy for other females and the immediate comparison many of us do subconsciously, is she more attractive? more qualified, more charming, creates a toxic work or academic environment for all involved. Where does toxic femininity occur? You know that girl you knew at school? Everyone knew at least one who gossiped, laughed at others behind their back, seemed overly concerned with popularity, and even engaged in a little backstabbing to put others back in their place. Well, that mean girl trope, unfortunately, doesn't end at school but continues into uni and even into the workplace, and that is toxic femininity. It occurs when women use the feminine stereotypes set, aside, set out by society to their advantage, as well as when women cover stabs and insults with a veil of kindness and empathy. Though it may not be the same perpetrator each time, you can guarantee that wherever you find yourself, you will find them or rather they will find you. So they have a, so this is feminism and toxic femininity. But why are these toxic females so commonplace? And are we bad feminists for calling this phenomenon out? So this is an article by yet another woman. I would ar actually argue the opposite. Feminism is about equality of all and women putting other women down does go against its very core. Indeed, putting anyone down, no matter what the gender may be, does not coincide with the values of equality. But when women in competitive environments turn against each other, rather than being mutually proud and respectful that, that against all the odds they both made it, it's really rather sad. So, like I said, toxic feminism, women have been taught to compete with one another from since yay high, you know, since they're little, little kids, you know, always wanting the attention, you know, always wanting the accolades and this and that and the other. So feminism, you know, the toxic form of fe feminism has been around forever, you know, but yet you want to blame men for stereotyping women. You want to blame men for sexualizing women. You want to blame men for being perverts. But all of these things you guys do against one another. Um, like the way you dress your young, your young daughters. Now you dress them as if you're, they're competing with grown women for the attention of men. But then when men look at your grown, your, your daughter, your 15, 14 year old daughter dressed like she's in her twenties and thirties. Now he's the pervert. But what does that make you for allowing your daughter to dress like that in the first place? You know, and then I've, I've often heard stories of mothers being jealous of their own daughters and sabotaging their relationships with the father because the father doesn't want to be with the mom. But of course, he loves his daughter. You see what I'm saying? So in order for you to in order for us to solve any issues, we got to look at the man or woman in the mirror. Now, toxic femininity at work. Women are 14 to 21% more likely than men to report experiencing uncivil treatment from female coworkers. 14 to 21% more likely than men. 
There is admittedly a, low, a lot of discussion now around making workplaces better for women, but an inconvenient truth is that it's not just toxic masculinity we should be stamping out. Women can be aggressors too, particularly against their uh, fellow females. Why are women bullying women? This and now having the unfortunate uh, situation or the, the unfortunate fortunate situation to, to work with a, the majority of women in some some of the work the places I, I work I worked at, it's just it's it's amazing to see you know how women maneuver, how women manipulate, how women have this you know, um, exclusive girl club for this set of women and then, you know, leaving out those women, but even within their own exclusive club, there is cliques within the clique. But yet and still, everyone's yelling about how a man treats a woman, um, how disrespectful a man is to a woman, but women are more so disrespectful Women can be more what they call catty, you know, towards women and women will hold a one, a woman will hold another woman back faster than a man would. I, I'll put anything on that. But anyway, next is why are women bullying women? We often hesitate to speak openly about toxic femininity. I'm gonna read that again. We often hesitate to speak openly about toxic femininity. So, as to not to reinforce the negative stereotypes about women being petty or bitchy. But with over 70% of women now admitting to feeling bullied by their female colleagues, it's about time we talk about the issue. Now look at that. This is an article by women about women. And the funny thing is, 70% of women are now admitting to being bullied by the other, other women. Essentially, women prefer to attack other women at work because of how society is structured. Women have traditionally targeted each other in personal contexts. You have the mother-in-law trope, the fake best friend, the classic sister rivalry, etc. But whether at home, at work, or in a social setting, this kind of insidious passive aggression is often difficult to call out since it operates under the sweet and smiley cover of feigned niceness. You know, you got to watch out for those women that always talk about, I'm trying to be positive, positive energy, no negative energy. You, you got to watch out for that. Women, excuse me, women are also very good at plausible denial and making some of these passive aggression, aggressive situations seem like they were done out of kindness. In addition to this women also put excruciating pressures on each other when it comes to looking a certain way. Now, when you women are dressing overly sexy and this and that and the other, I, I, I think I can speak for a lot of men when I say this. I don't, I don't want to control how women, how women dress. I don't care if you go out and have your half, your titties hanging out, your ass hanging out, your pussy lips showing. I don't care if you do that. You know, I don't care if another man's woman does that. I wouldn't want my woman doing it. I wouldn't want the lady that I'm interested in because we are representations of each other. And to me, that's trashy. You know, I want to, I, I, I want somebody that's classy, you know, um, if you speak to any man, any man, he'll let you know that no matter what a woman wears, I can tell if you have a nice body or not. I can tell if you got a hookup or not. You know, you don't have to show me all the goods. You don't have to do all of that because to me, the, all that, all that addiction to attention is that's a part of that toxicity with which feminism is calling liberation by being able to just look like a hoe. That's just my take on it. That's, that's my take. Those are my words right there. So the thing is, when you look at what a man likes, you know, sometimes, you know, we, you, you want to see a woman covered up. You want to see a woman showing, you know, 
the classiness that we used to get from women back in the day. You know, nowadays it's just man, oh you hey, what what's that? Uh slut shaming they call it. Don't slut shaming, uh the slut walk and all this other stuff. And you guys are um what's the word for it? You guys are are, are basically supporting this behavior, and then you're showing your daughters. So when you have a two, three-year-old little girl singing the lyrics to a Meg Thee Stallion song or Cardi B song, something has to be definitely wrong. So instead of calling men perverts for looking at your underage daughter for dressing like a straight-up hoe, why don't you check yourself on allowing your daughter to even walk out the crib like that? Pops, y'all got y'all got to stop y'all got to stop letting your daughters dress like this, man. Okay. Toxic femininity, signs to look out for. If you often witness ladies engaging in any of the below telltale toxic behaviors in your social or professional circles, then toxic femininity may be at large. Talking over and belittling other women. I saw that a lot. That's commonplace. That just seemed like a normal conversation between certain women. Passive aggression, think eye rolling, patronizing comments, fake laughing and niceties, smiley faces, following a harsh worded email, the list goes on. Sabotage, lying for their own gain, giving misleading advice, mocking others for their work or decisions, trying to manipulate situations to make others look bad. Jealousy, resentment, and bitterness towards the other women for their looks, popularity, and professional performance. Competing with other female colleagues through their looks, dominance, work, and sexuality. I've, I've spoken to so many women that say they've, they have experienced that. Hell, I've even spoken to women that said they've walked into an interview and felt like they didn't get the job because of the woman interviewing them may have seemed to be a little bit jealous. What can you do about toxic femininity? Once identified, should we then shun those, shun these supposedly toxic women? Wouldn't that mean sinking to their level? We must bear in mind that toxic femininity comes from a place of long-term societal conditioning and deep insecurities. Society has, for long as we can remember, taught us to target other women, usually in a personal or domestic setting. But as more women are in the workforce today uh, than ever before, that targeting also has also slipped into the workplace. This means that toxic femininity is likely to mold itself to a corporate setting as more women end up in decision-making positions. So when you all get to that point where it's women oppressing other women, then who are y'all going to blame for the shit y'all go through? This is more likely than not, there are more women fucking each other over than it is men fucking women over. Flat out. Women supporting women. Success is not a limited resource. As women, as she's saying, as women, uh, you all are just trying to get ahead and make a mark in an often challenging world. Past hurdles can make others appear to be nothing more than competitors, um, standing in the way of our own recognition and success. Women must all get past this way of thinking to better support each other. Together, women are most definitely stronger in today's day and age, and they should know better. Once women realize that success is not a limited resource and that you all can support and empower other women around, around without our own, the, your own flame being diminished, in fact, the opposite is true. The stronger the flame of your fellow women, the brighter your own flame will become. Then, you all can begin to ensure more supportive working environments and healthier female relationships, which I believe is, it could, I mean, that, that's, that's something that you guys need to do, but it ain't gonna happen because women are not thinking that because women today are in the mindset of, I gotta get mine. I gotta get mine, no matter what the cost. Women have become these, um, these, these, these aggressive um, women that will do and say anything just as long as they get ahead. You guys cannot no longer blame men for your position that you're in because a lot of times it's you fucking you over. That's all it is. Determination versus toxicity. You know, what's the difference? 
Um, question is, do women generally face more obstacles to rise to the top? Unfortunately, yes. Are women generally less aggressive and direct than men? This is often the case. But at risk of conforming to gender, gender norms, women tend to be particularly prone to destructive, sabotaging, and passive aggression when they feel threatened or insecure. It's simply how you all have been conditioned in this society. You all are led to believe that this is how to be ambitious and competitive, but it's not the only way. Women are going to compete against women. Hell, you got older women competing with younger women. This, this, this addictive drug called attention that social media has given a lot of women, you have older women now with their ass hanging out and titties hanging out trying to compete with younger women. I wish you old, older women would understand. You can't compete with a younger woman. You're supposed to be a guide for these younger women to see what it's like to get old, older gracefully, you know, older, you know, and, and with class and style. I could see the teenage girls in the 20-somethings acting in a certain manner, but when you reach your 30s and your 40s and your 50s, it's time to put down the bullshit, you know? Let's be clear, it's not the fierce determination and putting yourselves first that this article is criticizing. That part they say can definitely stay and they could actually do with more of it. But however, when the thirst for success sours into pushing other women out of the way, then it's time to take a step back. And see, and then this, this company says Hormona is a company built by women for women you know, so these are not my words that I'm reading, but what I'm saying is from the experience that I've had and I've seen other women um, hating on other women, I've seen other women give the looks, the stares, you know, start the rumors about certain women, especially if the woman is attractive, she's smart, and she's cool. She has a good, a good personality. All of a sudden, she's fucking this dude, that dude. Women are women, other women's biggest enemy, biggest threat. It's not men. Men are just used as the scapegoat. You all take what the 1% of men do to women and apply it to all men so that you can have an excuse for the bullshit y'all do to each other. And that's just, that's, that's as simple, simply as I can put it. You guys fuck each other over, but you, you don't want to, you want to throw the rocks and hide your hand and so you blame men for doing it. You know, especially in the black community. Black men can't oppress black women. Black women can only choose to get with the wrong guy, give her loyalty to him, and then be abused and misused and, and things like that. You know, so when you, when you look at what toxic feminism is, Look at yourself in the mirror. See if you, you, you've, have, you've displayed some of these tra traits. Some of the women you hang around may have displayed some of these traits. So, you know, let's, let's stamp out toxic feminism, um, <laughs> toxic masculinity as, as, you know, some, some people would call it or whatever. You know, it, it's, it's time that we do work together. We, we keep pushing too much independence when we should be interdependent. We should be able to work as a team. Teamwork make the dream work. So in saying that, I'd like to thank you all for jo joining me again for another episode of the Soul Vision Powercast. So if you saw the video, you like it, hit the button for me. Um, if you are not a Soul Visionary, hit the subscribe button. And if you've done both of those things, hey, just hit the share content and let's grow the community. Thank you. Be safe. Thank <laughs> you.